Wednesday, 6 o'clock on the dot. I know we're probably going to have a few people trickling in, and that's fine, but welcome to all of you who are here, both in person at Rosecliff and then with our trusty camera in the back. Hello, everyone on Zoom. Thank you for joining us tonight for our first lecture of the fall 2021 series, uh, Maker and Muse Sculpting the Gilded Age. My name is Leslie Jones. I'm the Director of Museum Affairs and Chief Curator for the Preservation Society. And I have the great pleasure of organizing our lectures. And when Eve presented this topic, or actually when I found the topic that Eve had been writing about, it was what essentially spurred this entire series. So um, in advance, I wanna thank Eve for all of her work and also being a wonderful friend. Uh, we do have two other lectures in this series that I hope you're aware of. Our next is Thursday, October 21st at 6 p.m., again here in Rosecliff and on Zoom, featuring Jessica Roscio, who's the director and curator of the Danforth Art Museum at Framingham University, which holds the archives of Meta Vo Warwick Fuller, who was an exceptionally talented African-American sculptor at the turn of the 20th century. And that lecture is titled Meta Vo Warwick Fuller, Race, Space, and the Making of a Professional Woman Artist. And then our final lecture of this series is Thursday, November 4th at 6 p.m. Uh, this will be Julie Aronson, the Curator of American Paintings, Sculpture, and Drawings from the Cincinnati Art Museum. That will be a Zoom-only lecture, uh, and that will be on Bessie Potter Vano. Uh, and the title is Bessie Potter Vano and Sculpture for the American Home. So please do sign up for those, uh, virtually or in person. Uh, a few notes about this evening's lecture. Uh, for our guests that are here in person, we will happily do Q&A following the conclusion of Eve's uh, talk. I will carry around a microphone, so keep your eyes peeled for that. For our, our friends on Zoom, unfortunately, we haven't figured out technology that well yet, so if there are no questions, if, there, if you have a question we don't get to this evening, please feel free to contact us, um, and we'll relay those questions on to Eve. Some other uh, Preservation Society news. Uh, we have some changes to our operating schedule, which usually happens during the fall. Chateau sur Mer closes October 11th for the winter. Uh, Green Animals Topiary Garden will, will close October 31st, but right now it's open through the weekends, so please come out and join us at the Topiary Gardens. And Marble House will close uh, November 1st through the 19th as we prepare for the holidays. Ooh, a little kickback. You got that microphone under control? Good to go, thank you. Um, so now it's my honor to introduce Eve, which is very difficult to do, uh, but I'm gonna try and keep it brief, but also uh, all the highlights. She is the former antiques columnist for the New York Times and the author of a prize-winning biography, Forever Seeing New Beauties, the forgotten impressionist Mary Rogers Williams, 1857 to 1907. There's actually a copy of it out on the the desk in the hallway if you'd like to take a look at it, and we do sell it in our stores. You can also visit evecon.com to get your copy. Uh, she contributes regularly to The Times, the magazine Antiques, Apollo Magazine, and Atlas Obscura, and her book now in progress is provisionally titled Queen of Bohemia, Predicts Own Death, the Forgotten Journalist Zoe Anderson Norris, 1860 to 1914. Uh, I also want to thank Eve as well as the magazine Antiques who provided complimentary copies of her article on Hetty Anderson. So please pick up a copy if you're here and enjoy. And with that, it's my distinct pleasure to welcome Eve to talk to us tonight about Hetty Anderson. Welcome, Eve. Thank you, Leslie, for that lovely introduction. Thanks to everyone for coming. Thanks to the, the Preservation Society staff for setting this up. What a thrill it is to be giving a talk in this spectacular home that I've been visiting since I was, and marveling at since I was in college. Um, and also in a town that has so heroically preserved so much neoclassical architecture in the spirit of the goddess like Miss Anderson and um, in a town also that um, has paid tribute to so much great art and architecture commissioned by powerful women, again, in the spirit of the goddess like Miss Anderson. So I'm gonna talk for half an hour-ish about uh, what I know, I'm gonna time myself so that it doesn't, I don't run too far over. I'll get my husband to start waving. Um, 
I, um, I'm gonna talk for half an hour-ish about what I know and don't know about Hetty Anderson, um, how I stumbled upon this topic and researched her to some extent, and um, why she matters in the midst of a groundswell of interest in Gilded Age artists' models. Um, trigger warning, I'm going to be quoting from historical documents that use terms for African-Americans that are now considered offensive. And um, there will be moments in this story that are raw and tragic as there are with any story um, involving race in America. So um, you can see the screens on, yes, okay. So um, last fall, I went to the Met. One of the first exhibitions that I got back into post COVID lockdown was the 150th anniversary show with galleries devoted to um, you know, new thoughts about their curatorial and acquisition policies through the ages. <clears throat> there was a three foot tall uh, gilded bronze statue on view that I'd never paid attention to before. It's the reduced scale version of Augusta St. Gaudens's larger than life allegorical figure of victory, um, which is posed in front of um, General Sherman on horseback at the southeast corner of Central Park near the Plaza Hotel. Anyone who's been to New York has walked past. It, there could not be a more high profile monument in New York. I had just never paid attention to the Met having a smaller version of it. And I read the label and it said that the woman who had posed, Hetty Anderson was black. She posed for a number of New York artists around 1900 or so, and she later worked at the Met. And my eyes stung for a moment because I realized that she would have been standing somewhere around where I was standing looking at her younger self covered in gold. And what was that like? And did she ever tell anybody? So I went home and Googled her. Um, at, so there any recent scholarship that you're seeing about her that I didn't write is full of assumptions and unsubstantiated, um, you know, just a lot of people jump to a lot of conclusions about her based on no uh, real documentation. The only decent scholarship that's been done about her was done by these two amazing people, um, Bill and Willow Hagens. Bill died in 2015. It's with his widow, uh, Willow Hagens, that I have been collaborating for a year now, mm. and I hope she's on this Zoom call because it's been an amazing year-long research journey. So they published great scholarship about her starting in the 1990s or so. They started because Bill's grandmother, whose name was Jean Wallace McCampbell Lee, Mama Jean, as she was known, Bill and Willow were going off to New York around 1980, and Mama Jean said, while you're there, say hello to Cousin Tootie for me. And they said, who's Cousin Tootie? And she explained that she'd had a cousin named Hetty Anderson who'd posed for statues. There were statues depicting her in New York and also had posed for coins. And she also said, the family didn't talk about her because she took off her clothes for a living. And this was something of an embarrassment. This is a multiply graduate degreed African-American family. So Mama Jean told them about Cousin Tootie around 1980, and they dove into research. They are independent researchers among Bill and Willow specialties over the years have been um, the history of American coins and Anders Zorn, the great Swedish Gilded Age painter. They wrote the definitive book on his uh, trips to America. So I was connected to them by Henry Duffy, who's the head curator at the Augusta St. Gaudens gorgeously preserved home and studio in Cornish, New Hampshire. And it's been an amazing year long journey. So it's on the shoulders of these giants that you know, that's made it possible for me to stand before you today. So here's what we know and don't know. Hetty Anderson was born in 1873 in Columbia, South Carolina. Um, that's her mother on the left, Caroline. Lee is her maiden name. Scott was the married name she went by for much of her life. She was briefly married to a black barber named Joseph Scott who died young. Um, Caroline and her parents, Henry and Eliza Lee, were designated free colored persons before the Civil War, which meant that they could um, own land and keep wages that they earned. Um, Caroline worked as a seamstress. Henry, her father, worked as a carpenter over the years. Um, it, as I understand it, to be designated free colored persons um, in the early 1800s, as Henry and Eliza and Caroline were, it meant that their mothers would have had to have been free. Almost undoubtedly, Henry and Eliza Lee were the offspring of a white slave owner and a formerly enslaved woman. 
because slavery was inherited matrilineally. Um, the, as I understand it, in 17th century Virginia, American, newly minted Americans realized that they had to change British precedent, that you could not have freedom be inherited from a white father who had a child with a, an enslaved black woman. If you have freedom granted to the child, the half black child of every white slave owner, then the system of control over black women's bodies breaks down. The system of enslavement breaks down. So. I have not yet been able to trace Henry, um, uh, Henry and Eliza's white um, ancestry. I don't have um, details on Hetty's white ancestors yet. Caroline has um, enough money before the Civil War that she buys an entire street corner in um, uh, Columbia. The buildings that she owned are gone, but um, it's a Jewish cemetery across the street. There's a small walled cemetery across the street that does survive, and someday I'll get to Columbia and get a sense of the place where Hetty grew up. Hetty has an older brother. His name is Charles Dickerson. Um, a man named Benjamin Dickerson is listed in documents as the father of Hetty and her brother. And I don't know anything about him. I don't know his race. I don't know if Caroline ever married him. Um, I, no one knows why Hetty adopted as an adult the last name Anderson. No one knows where she got that from. Her brother Charles kept the last name Dickerson. We have no idea why Hetty um, took on that last name. She might have been briefly married or um, she might have just chosen that name. It's not clear where she got Anderson from. So um, bear with me that there's no family tree posted above my head. If you have any questions about this complicated family, I'm happy to answer questions um, after the talk. I'm just trying to give you a sense of the milieu that she grew up in. The lower right on that slide is, um, that is the courthouse in Columbia, South Carolina. It was one of many buildings in town that were being that were undergoing literal reconstruction when Hetty was a child, in addition to the town going undergoing the political movement reconstruction. Caroline had a sister named Martha who married a guy named Andrew Madison Wallace, who was a builder, and he worked on that courthouse among other projects. It's possible that having a maternal grandfather and an uncle who were in the construction trades inspired Hetty's interest in the arts and design. It's not clear. What is in black and white is that Hetty's uncle, Andrew Madison Wallace, was the son of a priest, an Irish-born priest who'd come to New York in the early 1800s. James Wallace was his name. He's in New York for a few years in the early 1800s, and then he comes to Columbia. He has three sons with a woman that he enslaved, and her name is either Sarah or Mary. The documents conflict. It's not clear. Um, he had, um, he's buried with honors in the Basilica graveyard at, in, in Columbia, and he obviously shouldn't be because he's obviously a terrible priest, terrible life partner, terrible father. Um, oh, and also he wrote an astronomy textbook in the 1810s. He's also a really boring writer. Um, <laughs> On, on the, I got a copy of his boring astronomy textbook um, on eBay, and you can see on the title page, it's signed Thomas Levins. Who's Thomas Levins? Thomas Levins was the librarian who founded Georgetown's library. Um, the copy that I own would have been floating around Georgetown in the early 19th century when they were trying to figure out which of the hundreds of human beings they owned they were gonna sell to pay off their debts. Um, James Wallace, Hetty's great uncle, he dies in 1851. He intends to free his family um, in his will, but the Catholic Church keeps them instead because they're valuable. And the Catholic Church sends out Hetty's uncle Andrew and his brothers um, to work at various plantations. Their talents include construction and playing musical instruments and um, keeps their wages. And eventually sometime in the late 1850s or so, these three young men just vanish. They're sent out on some kind of job and they just vanish. And um, I know that Hetty's uncle, Andrew Madison Wallace, got with her Aunt Martha and a few of their kids who were born in South Carolina to Canada before the Civil War. Apparently, it's much more common than we realize. He went by steamship. There's a fascinating new book called um, uh, Sailing to Freedom about how many um, enslaved African Americans got to um, the North, Northeast by ship. Um, he would have gotten to probably Boston with his family and then um, gone probably by train from Boston to Toronto. As I understand it, um, in order for a, a, a black family to have pulled off that escape, um, they were possibly stowaways or possibly um, the lighter skinned members of the family pretended to own the darker skinned members of the family um, in order to maintain the subterfuge that they were a slave owning family um, taking a trip. These are the stories that Hetty would have heard growing up.
So um, Columbia, Andrew Mattis Wallace and his family come back to Columbia around the time that Hetty is born. There is hope for black people in Columbia at that time. There are two co-ed HBCUs founded, Allen University, Benedict College, they both still exist. Um, the Howard School is built there. That's what you're looking at on the right in this slide. Um, it was the state's first K through 12 public school for black children. I know that Hetty had relatives who studied there and also eventually taught there, but I don't know where Hetty got her formal education. About 20-ish letters in her hand survive, and they are the handwriting and the grammar and word choices and spelling even of an educated person, but I don't know where she studied. I do know that Allen University had an activist dean named um, a woman named Hallie Brown, who suggested that black women exercise by posing as in the form of Greek statues. And I don't know if this is a class that Hetty took, but I do know that this was her milieu. So I, again, no, I saw apologies for having no family tree, happy to answer any questions. I'm just trying to give you a sense of her background. These are four, just four of her many, many incredibly accomplished cousins. Um, on the left is um, her cousin, uh, Joseph Wallace. He teaches at and eventually runs various HBCUs. Second from left in the hat, that's Mama Jean. That's Hetty's cousin who made it possible for me to stand before you today giving this talk. Mama Jean trained and worked as a librarian. Both her husbands were physicians. One of them ran a hospital at Tuskegee. Um, second from right, that's Hetty's cousin Sally or Sarah Arnett. She um, was married to an activist pastor. She was an activist herself. She gave lectures. She participated in his pastorate. And on the right in the bowler hat, that's um, Hetty's cousin Henry Wallace, who um, works as a politician and a civil servant and eventually writes articles um, about um, the history of black people um, during reconstruction in South Carolina. So this is an educated Episcopalian group and um, by 1900 or so, opportunities in the segregated brutal South have dried up to the point that by 1900 or so, basically none of Hetty's relatives remain in South Carolina. They've all moved to St. Louis, Detroit, Chicago, and New York. By the mid 1890s, Hetty and her mother Caroline has worked as a seamstress over the years. Hetty's professions in various documents over the years are listed as seamstress and clerk. They have moved to 94th Street and Amsterdam Avenue in Manhattan, and they remain there for the rest of their lives. Uh, the building still stands. Uh, it still has no elevator. I tromped up the same uh, uh, you know, metal steps that Hetty would have tromped up every day. There used to be a gorgeous turreted public school nearby. Um, Hetty's brother by this point is living in um, southern New Jersey. He's working as a horse trainer, Charles Dickerson. He is um, passing for white. He does not tell his family that he ha has black ancestry. His family only finds out after his death when they start researching his glamorous sister that they'd heard stories about, the artist's model. Um, they don't know why Hetty used the last name Anderson either. Descendants of her brother Charles are alive. Um, Hetty and her mother are listed as white in various documents, uh, government documents, including the census. But as I understand it, they were not technically passing or crossing the line because they stayed in touch with family members who were living as activists in the black world, including um, Mama Jean. When Hetty gets to New York, she is said to have uh, started posing at and even taking classes at the Art Students League, but I haven't found the documentation of that yet. Um, these in the center, that's the only known surviving photograph of Hetty Anderson. It belongs to Willow Hagen's, bless her, Hetty's cousin, the steward of Hetty's um, story and artifacts. On the left, that's a photo of Hetty's mother, Caroline. Um, Hetty's photo was taken by the Co Studio in New York, an elite photography studio, Caroline's photo, that somebody at some point on the right um, made a painting of. We're not sure who did that, who, that painting. That's a, a piece in the family. Um, these elite photography studios, maybe they connected Hetty to the artists who were having their paintings and sculptures photographed at these places, I'm not sure, or maybe Hetty was sent to get her photograph taken by one of the artists that she had met somehow. Um, the documentation just doesn't survive of how she chose that career path. So 
What we do know, because it's written down carefully, is that uh, in John Lafarge's ledger books, John Lafarge, the great painter, stained glass designer who has so many Newport connections, um, by the mid late 1890s, she is posing for him while he's working on this mural for um, Bowdoin College's art museum, a gorgeous uh, domed building designed by Charles McKim. In this lunette mural, the central figure is uh, based on Hetty Anderson. Um, please keep in mind, I'm gonna be showing you a number of images by various artists of her in forms of uh, on canvas and in, uh, in three dimensions. These are not uh, portraits, these are likenesses. The artists edited her face, her hair, her body, her skin tone, however the commission demanded. But what you will see recur through the rest of my talk is um, you will never see her posing in any kind of submissive position. Um, when an artist wanted to do, for example, Andromeda in chains, it's not Hetty Anderson that he hired um, or she hired. Um, of the heroic type, Hetty was described at in one of the three or four wisps of newspaper articles I can find about her. Uh, journalists don't ever seem to have met her or interviewed her, but she's mentioned in the press three or four times of the heroic type. So she's not the vixen, she's not the, um, you know, the giddy nymph on the edge of the fountain, right? Any of that kind of sculpture, you, if you were working on that, you didn't hire Hetty Anderson of the heroic type. In this mural, you can see she's holding a bundle of sticks, right? She's holding a fasces, you know, the traditional symbol of power. And um, the, the figure on, on the left, in, in, your, in your image, in the, in the standing in the pinkish robe, that um, represents Athena, the goddess of, among other things, the arts. And the figure on the right in the cape and the, and the red cape and the crown is a personification of the citizens of Athens. And they're gazing up and admiring this goddess in their midst. And the only uh, figure in this, in this tableau that's not admiring her, she's leaning on a herm, right? It's a man's head, you know, as a, as a capital and he's got downcast eyes. Um, She's of the heroic type, the goddess like Miss Anderson. Her timing is great because uh, with apologies to people in this room who devoted their scholarly lives to this subject, right? You've got a groundswell of neoclassical architecture sweeping across America for buildings like this, right? You've got residential, commercial, civic, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you need to stock them with goddesses. By the late 1890s, she's posing often for Augusta St. Gaudens. Um, that's the Sherman Monument in plaster. And I love how she towers over the sculptor and his entourage in this photo. Um, third, it's, uh, it's St. Gaudens is third from left in this photo in the beard and the, and the, and the smock. Um, a few years after the Sherman Monument is unveiled, he brings Hetty back to his studio to pose for Liberty, the allegorical figure of Liberty on the $20 gold coin. Um, Teddy Roosevelt had commissioned these coins from um, Augusta St. Gaudens to elevate the caliber of American coin design. And when, um, when Augusta St. Gaudens finished depicting Hetty on the $20 gold coin, it was deemed to be of equal, if not superior caliber to ancient Greek precedents. Um, St. Gaudens calls her the goddess like Miss Anderson. He describes her as the handsomest model he'd ever seen of either sex. And he praises her ability to pose patiently, steadily, and thoroughly in the spirit one wished. Sherman Monuments, one of the most photographed monuments anywhere ever, right in Hetty's time and in our own. I go visit it all the time. I wave to Cousin Tootie in, the, in memory of Mama Jean, whose um, original preserving of Hetty's story is the reason I stand before you today. Um, it's, um, there's a plaque at the base that explains who Hetty was and explains the significance of the monument, but nobody reads the plaque. Not only does no one have any idea who Hetty is, in most cases, when I'm eavesdropping on people, they have no idea who Sherman is, right? <laughs> there, you know, there's the distracted dad chasing the toddler, and he's like, who's that? Uh -uh. No one has any idea who these people are. Um, I don't, I know that um, Augustus St. Gaudens and his son Homer knew that Hetty was black, there's brief references in their writing to her having Negro blood in her veins. Um, I don't know who in the wider world knew she was black, so I don't know who understood that it was poignant and powerful, that it's a, the, a figure of a black woman leading the forces of emancipation. And I don't know who knew that it was ironic that she's also leading the man whose forces at the end of the Civil War, when they come into Columbia, cause devastating fires, that his forces effectively destroyed her hometown. Um, he's under the, one of the horse's feet is a, is a pine branch. It's incredibly detailed. It is specifically meant to represent the pines of Georgia that Sherman's forces crushed. 
one day while she's posing for St. Gaudens, his good friend, the Swedish painter Anders Sorn, stops by and does this quick sketch on a copper plate for an etching. Um, many people look at this image and jump to the conclusion that St. Gaudens and Hetty were having an affair. And um, I have absolutely no documentation for that. What I have is um, there's voluminous correspondence for St. Gaudens that survives. And um, his, his, his correspondence is raw and emotional. And he'll talk about you know, how, what a work he's proud of, proud of, what he hates himself for, you know, which relative or friend was, you know, in tragic circumstances. There's literally lines in his letters that are along the lines of, I walked down the street and everybody just seemed to be thinking about sex, you know, this kind of raw, unVictorian stuff. So I personally firmly believe that had he had an affair with Hetty Anderson, he wouldn't have been able to not tell people and we would know. There is no documentation. There's just a ton of unstoppable speculation online. You just, yes, in errors on the internet. Um, what I also see in this, what I actually see in this image based on the Hagens' analysis is um, that the model is radiating youth and vitality behind the um, exhausted, haggard, artist. He's only in his late 40s when this is done, but he's already suffering from um, the terminal cancer that would kill him a few years later. He respects the goddess like Miss Anderson to the point that he gives her a plaster bust portrait of herself. On the neck of this piece, which is in the hands of, bless her, Willow Hagens, it says to Hetty Anderson, Augusta St. Gaudens, 1897. Um, it was cast in bronze at some point and we don't know when. And on the left and the right in this slide, you're seeing um, circa you know, early 1900s photos of it. And can you make out there's a plaque on the neck? There's sort of a flat tablet on the neck that you might be able to make out. Um, that, had, that was taken off at some point, you know, in, in its current state, it has a, a sort of contoured plaque at the base of the neck. The plaque says, first sketch of head of victory Sherman monument. When the, the eventual monument has a much more generic face, right? That doesn't look like Hetty. This is a portrait of Hetty that St. Gaudens did and gave to her. It had that plaque on its neck when it was sent, um, when Hetty lent it for a posthumous retrospective of St. Gaudens. He dies in 1907 for a couple of years after his death, an, an exhibition travels with Hetty's loan of this bust in it. Um, at some point, oh, when the exhibition gets rolling, Homer St. Gaudens, Augustus's son, asks to borrow it back to make replicas for sale. And Hetty's letter to him survives. And she says, Mr. St. Gaudens gave this bust to me. He said it's valuable. Um, it retains its value almost only if it remains the only one in existence. I will not lend it. She um, defies, she goes up against and defies the family of one of the most powerful sculptors in America. This woman had nerves of steel. Uh, but the family does make many copies of Victory. It's not clear how many survive. Um, on the left, the large image, that's the version at the Toledo Museum of Art. Lower right is at um, Arlington National Cemetery. Center of the top row, that's a version that's at St. Gaudens' Preserve Studio in Cornish. And top right, that's a version of Victory um, that came up for sale at Christie's a few years ago in New York. Uh, somebody had it um, perched atop their enormous green upholstered piece of furniture in there. Um, suburban New York mansion. Um, so it's sold to Christie's for a couple million dollars. Um, the goddess like Miss Anderson. So by 1900 or so, she's posing often for Daniel Chester French. And again, with apologies to people in this room who devoted their scholarly lives to this subject, he is of course best known for the figure of Lincoln at the Washington Memorial. She poses again and again for French. Um, the work you're seeing here is called The Spirit of Life. It um, is a tribute it's a posthumous tribute to Spencer Trask, the great financier philanthropist who was killed in a horrific car accident coming home to Saratoga. It's in a park in Saratoga. It was commissioned by his widow, Katrina Trask, who's known for among many other things for uh, founding um, Yado, the artist's retreat that still exists. Um, and when you wanted, to, so French did do figures of vixens and victims over the years. He did Andromeda in chains, but when he hired Hetty Anderson, it was for works that exuded power and had dignity and uh, calm and um, gave comfort. He cast her right foot while he was working on the spirit of life and that cast of her foot survives at Chesterwood, his gorgeously preserved home and studio in Western Mass. Um, she poses for French while he's working on this allegorical figure of a sculptor, 
um, in stone on the left, that's at the, on the grounds of the St. Louis Art Museum. It's, um, right, she's got a tool, she's got a mallet in her right hand and under her arm, she's cradling two human figures that are emerging from stone. He had done it in plaster for the World's Fair in St. Louis in 1904 and then a few years later rendered it in stone. The um, doorway that you're seeing on the right in this image, that is, um, the, it's bronze reliefs that French did for the, um, the Boston Public Library. And Hetty is the figure on the left of truth. She's holding a looking glass in one hand and a crystal ball in the other. She poses for French while he's working on this uh, Civil War memorial that survives in Concord, Mass. Um, there were four Melvin brothers from Concord who went to serve in the Civil War, and three of them were killed in different, separately in different horrific ways. The surviving brother commissioned this uh, memorial to them in Concord. And I love how she towers over this group of uh, veterans at the unveiling of the statue. Mourning Victory is its official name. You can see she's got an American flag draped over her head and in her hand, she's clutching a laurel branch, um, a, a symbol of uh, triumph. She poses for French while he's, while he's working on this angel of peace, which survives in a cemetery in Northwest New Jersey. It's um, at the grave of a guy named Rutherford Stuyvesant, blue blood philanthropist. His real name was Stuyvesant Rutherford, but when he was a little kid, his family made him change his name so that he would be sure to inherit the Stuyvesant fortune. Um, in this image particularly, the hair, the face, it really bears no resemblance to um, Hetty Anderson. But um, fourth from the right, hanging down from that shelf at Chesterwood is a cast of her right hand that French made while he was working on the Angel of Peace. Um, my husband, Brad, bless him, who drives me everywhere, is gonna drive me out to Northwest New Jersey to take a look at that, at that sculpture very soon, right? He's nodding, okay. Um, so Daniel Chester French and Augustus St. Gaudens have a protege named Adolf Weinman. Um, on the left, you can see a 25 foot tall statue that he based on Hetty called Civic Fame. Um, it is perched atop the municipal building downtown. Um, and uh, when I go over the Brooklyn Bridge, I wave to Cousin Tootie far up in the air. It's covered in gold and there's um, the toga flares back dramatically in the back. She is this luminous glittering figure in, in the sky. Um, on the right, that's a photo of um, Evelyn Beatrice Longman at work. She's an underappreciated sculptor. She was a protege of French. She worked on numerous public memorials, cemeteries, cemetery uh, stones. It's not clear which of Evelyn Beatrice Longman's work was inspired by Hetty, but I do know that when they were uh, collaborating, um, Evelyn Beatrice Longman did a crouching, grieving figure that is, um, was, it's in a cemetery in Brooklyn and in tribute to um, victims of the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire. Uh, there were a number of other known black models in um, Hetty's day. Uh, one of them was named Thomas McKellar. The Gardner Museum in Boston did a glorious show about him um, last year. McKellar was from North Carolina. He moved to Boston around 1900. He was working as a bellhop at a fancy hotel when he was discovered by the great painter, John Singer Sargent. And Sargent renders McKellar, he whitens, edits McKellar into various deities in gorgeous paintings and murals. He's, uh, McKellar poses as Atlas, um, McKellar poses as Apollo. When Sargent worked on works, uh, sketches and paintings that were not meant for display or sale, he depicted McKellar as he actually looked. Um, McKellar also worked as a body model for Sargent, which meant he posed in the, in the outfits of people who were too busy to sit for hours in the, in the painter's studio. McKellar was the body model when um, Sargent was working on a portrait of Abbott Lawrence Lowell, the Harvard president. So I don't know who knew in the, and when that portrait was unveiled that it was ironic that a black man was posing inside the body dressed in full university regalia of a Harvard president who was famously a racist and an anti-Semite. Um, Hetty's most interesting colleague in New York was Maurice Hunter. Um, the man of a thousand faces was how he advertised himself. Hetty, as far as I can tell, avoided the press at all costs. 
There's three, four wisps of newspaper articles that mention her. No one ever seems to have interviewed her. Um, Maurice Hunter loved to talk to the press. His own scrapbooks of clippings about him survive at the Schomburg Center, at the New York Public Library, and also at Columbia University. The man of a thousand faces. He advertised that he could be any kind of black person the painter, sculptor, illustrator wanted. I can be a porter, I can be a waiter, I can be an enslaved person, I can be a snake charmer, I can be an African chieftain. Um, he claimed to be descended from African chieftains, but he actually apparently was from Suriname in South America. And some artists um, used him as a body model, but put a Caucasian head on it. For instance, in the war memorials you're seeing on the right by Daniel Chester French. It's called um, In Flanders Field. It's a World War I memorial that survives in um, uh, Milton, Massachusetts. Um, I don't know how Hetty avoided journalists because writers in her time were obsessed with artists' models. Um, this is, their obsession is represented in and was apparently fueled by a massively best-selling novel called Trilby in the 1890s by George du Maurier. Um, Trilby is an Irish woman who moves to Paris and becomes an artist's model. She falls under the spell of a guy named Svengali, and when, when hypnotized by him, she can sing beautifully, and when not hypnotized, she can't sing, and um, she's publicly humiliated, and she dies tragically young. Um, this is a massive bestseller. It's a terrible book. Svengali is portrayed with every imaginable anti-Semitic trope you know, about Jews as puppeteers controlling the world. It's a terrible book. It was a massive bestseller. And in one of the wisps of newspaper articles that mentions Hetty, it calls her the Trilby of Gotham, although her life actually bears no resemblance to the life of this um, Irish woman, fictional Irish woman. Um, you're looking at half of a full page article that appeared about which women posed for which body parts on the great triumphal arch that was set up briefly uh, near Madison Square in New York for Admiral Dewey. Literally, the journalists are obsessed. Whose neck, whose arms, who had great hands, but not very good shoulders. So we had to use a different model for X, Y, and Z. Literally, number four in this image, supposedly, the feet, calves, knees, those in this article are said to be the feet, calves, knees of Hetty Anderson. People wrote that she never wore a corset in her life, so she never distorted her figure, or um, you know, she had milky skin, this kind of thing. I have absolutely no idea if anyone ever met her. I don't even know if that's a real photo of, of her, uh, of her uh, feet, knees, legs. Um, there's, there, artists, there, were, there was such an obsession with which artists had used which models. I found a fan letter to the sculptor John Quincy Adams Ward filed away at, at, uh, in his papers at New York Historical Society. And a fan literally writes, I've got to know who posed for the legs of that Shakespeare statue you did in Central Park, because so-and-so's widow swears that those are his you know, ankles, but I actually think it was so-and-so's legs, this kind of thing. Writers are obsessed. I have no idea how Hetty managed to avoid them. Around 1900, someone actually asks an artist model what her life is like. She's working at the Art Students League and she says, actually, my life is terrible. The reason I'm napping between modeling sessions is not because I'm you know, staying out all night drinking. It's because I don't have enough to eat and I don't have a place to stay. And I've come to New York from the West or the South and everything's gone terribly wrong and artists are preying on me. And so by 1900 or so, women artists, most prominently Cecilia Bowe, the great portrait painter, society portrait painter, band together and form a club, a charity to help artists models. The Art Workers Club for Women, it's called. It's, it had a clubhouse in the West 50s. It exists into the late 1930s. Um, they have a restaurant. They give these women loans. They help these women find jobs with you know, the more reputable artists. And on the photo on the left, you can see that women are examining gowns at the clubhouse. They lent out gowns to these women, but the rules were very strict. You can only wear these for posing for work and you can't wear them to parties and restaurants. Um, I don't know if Hetty was um, a member in any way, if she was associated with this group at all. I don't see her name in the files for the, that are at New York Historical, but um, this is her milieu. By the late 1910s, she's not working as, an, as a model anymore. Um, obviously, um, so by the late 1910s, World War I has quashed a lot of construction. And also once you have Duchamp's nude descending a staircase, you have abstraction coming in, you have far less demand for a goddess-like model. 
by the late 1910s, some of her artist friends, including Daniel Chester French, Evelyn Beatrice Longman, help her get a job at the Met as a classroom attendant. And she works in the basement classrooms where they have wonderful pioneering children's programs and um, programs for the disabled and exhibitions, including of children's work. And her job is to um, keep the classrooms tidy. Um, she's responsible for, among other things, the Met, bless them, has a 50-page employment file for her from the late 1910s. I can tell you, you know, which days she worked. They are amazing record keepers. Um, she tidied up the lantern slides that were used to illustrate lectures, both on site at the Met and also um, the Met used to lend them out for, um, for lectures elsewhere with apologies to people in this room who know, right? It's a, it's a tin can, basically, with a beastly hot light bulb in it, the lantern, and then you pop the glass slides in and out in front of the lens with a wooden frame. She was tidying up the lantern slides. In the center of this image is a lantern slide depicting the Sherman Monument that I got on eBay. And you can see that it came out of the Art Institute of Chicago's um, collection. Almost every American cultural institution had a collection of these circa 1900. They've all been widely dispersed. It is possible that Hetty filed away an image on a lantern slide of a work that she had posed for. Um, I know that when she was at the Met, they already owned at least two images of her in three dimensions. Um, on the right, that's Victory, the one that I saw that set me off on this year long journey. And on the left, that's Morning Victory. That's Daniel, that's a in reverse version of Daniel Chester French's um, Civil War Memorial in Concord. Um, by 1920, she's not working. The Met has put her on sick leave. Um, and it, based on the Met's gorgeous 50 page uh, employment file, I can tell you her version of the story, which is that she was feeling much better and she wanted to come back to work. And uh, she was refusing sick pay. I will not take checks for work I have not performed. Um, she defied the most powerful cultural institution in America. Her coworkers' version of the story was that she was depressed and weeping and um, paranoid that people were staring at her and uh, believing that evil forces were controlling her. And um, she eventually stops working at the Met. They send a psychiatrist to visit her, the George Amston, he was the brother-in-law of the sculptor Herbert Adams. And he reports to the Met that all she needs is six months in a sanitarium and she would be good as new. And he suggests that she go to a particular asylum in the New York suburbs where he worked. And her mother, Caroline, is still alive at this time. Caroline dies in 1928. Um, Caroline refuses to let Hetty go, and Hetty refuses to go. And, um, you know, thank God, because they were doing terrible things to human beings at asylums like this in the 1910s, 1920s, you know, removing organs in pursuit of, of cures for mental illness. I know that even in poor health, she stayed in touch with some of her relatives. Lower right, that's Mama Jean, the, the librarian. Um, and I, kn I know she stayed in touch with Mama Jean. I'm not sure if she stayed in touch with the cousin in the bow tie, a guy named William Wallace, who ends up working as a dentist in New York, the guy in the bowler hat. Henry Wallace, Hetty's cousin, is living in Harlem by the time, by 1920 or so. I don't know if they were in touch. He's writing articles for the Journal of Negro History. And on the far left, Hetty's cousin, Sarah or Sally Arnett. I know she hated that cousin. She would sometimes call out that cousin's name in a rage. And it's possible Sally, Sarah Arnett, a pastor's wife disapproved of Hetty's career choice. We don't know. Um, it is said by Charles Dickerson, Hetty's brother's descendants, that Hetty cracked up and had a breakdown after seeing a boyfriend killed by a trolley on Amsterdam Avenue in front of her apartment building, but I can't find documentation of that. I can't find an adult male killed in front of her building. A lot of people were killed in front of her building, mostly children. And then there was an adult woman at one point. I mean, we don't even know Hetty's sexual orientation. I can't find any documentation of what might have set off her breakdown. What I do know is that, thanks to the Mets uh, employment file, um, is that Hetty had friends, that image on the left, um, is of an, uh, a golf game up, up on paper or board with, that, you would, that you would play golf with different colored pencils on it. That was designed by Linny and Leon Traboul, 
who were good friends of Hetty's and tried to help her. And they ran a, a, a golf course in the Bronx. They had a resort and they wanted Hetty to come work for them so that she would get some fresh air instead of working in the Mets uh, basement classrooms. It's not clear Hetty ever took that job, but she had interesting friends and relatives around her to the end. So uh, Caroline dies in 1928. Hetty dies in 1938. By that point, she hasn't worked in years, and yet, and I can't explain this, she has a substantial estate. She has been living in some financial comfort. She has over $20,000. She has diamond jewelry, a grand piano. Um, she owned family property in Colombia into the late 1930s. She owned a watercolor of Samoa by John Lafarge, which is now unlocated. Um, we, we have evidence that she bought it at a New York auction at one point. So, um, she and her mother, during the decades they live in New York, they are listed as white in various government documents, but when their bodies are shipped home to be buried in a mostly white cemetery in Colombia, they are once again listed as colored. And the Lee family, Caroline's uh, family, um, they had a dozen plots in this cemetery, only 10, only 10 are empty, only two were ever used for burial, and I don't know why. I don't know why no markers were ever put on Hetty's grave. Um, on the top right, that's a marker that's right nearby for Hetty's uncle, Andrew Madison Wallace, the son of a priest born enslaved by his own father who got his family to Canada by steamship before the Civil War. He has a stone in the African-American cemetery next to the white cemetery where Hetty and Caroline are buried. I don't know why the family is separated like that. Hetty's brother who was passing for white, that's his gravestone lower right um, in Southern New Jersey. So Hetty has some fans who, um, since Willow Hagens and I have been making our research public, are arguing their outrage that Hetty has no marker on her grave. But in any case, putting a marker there, I'm not sure what the cemetery would allow. It certainly would be a family decision and not because of public advocacy. And also, how poignant and powerful is it that a woman who posed for so many memorial statues that gave comfort to the grieving um, has no stone of her own. So, uh, barreling towards the end here. So, this is a fraction of the books I own with some image of Hetty on the cover. Anybody who does a book about the artists that she posed for, Daniel Chester French, Augusta St. Gaudens, if there's a chance to put Hetty on the cover, anybody who does a history of American coinage, if there's a chance to put Hetty on the cover, the book designers seem to take that chance. This is a fraction of the number of books I own. I like to think that her charisma as an artist's model has something to do with that. Um, the, the, other are the other models of her time. So top, top left, that is um, the Gardner Museum's catalog for their gorgeous show last year about Thomas McKellar. He ended up working for the post office and fell into some financial straits over the years. Uh, top right, that's uh, the Morgan Library did a show a few years ago about Miss Lala, a black circus performer who posed for Degas and um, had a, um, she, stopped, um, she stopped working as an aerialist at some point. A, a colleague was killed in a terrible fall in front of her and she stopped uh, performing. The lower row far left, that is um, a recent biography of Marie Van Gotem, who posed for Degas' Little Dancer and her adult years are tragic, you know, in, in poverty, obscurity, and after she dies after years of working as a prostitute. Uh, the center of the bottom row, that's a recent biography of Hetty's most scandalous colleague, Audrey Munson, who posed for countless paintings and sculpture um, and uh, um, had terrible taste in men, made scandalous headlines, tried to control her image, tried to, you know, to control how she was portrayed in the press. By age 40 or so, around 1930, she's paranoid and her own family has her committed to an asylum where she stays for the next six decades. She dies at over age 100. And Lower Wright, recent gorgeous book about uh, Joanna Hiffernan. She was one of Whistler's models. She was one of Whistler's mistresses. She helped raise a son he had with a different mistress. She helped run his business over the years and she died in her 40s um, of, of disease. And she is said to be one of the models for George du Maurier's Trilby. So Hetty's life, although she suffered in, she was in poor health towards the end, as artists models lives go, she's one of the few who maintained her financial independence, her dignity, 
her privacy, and she's got to be the only one who copyrighted her own image, copyrighted a bust of her by a powerful sculptor and fought off his family who wanted to replicate it. So uh, just a few more slides really quickly. Um, you can buy Hetty's image on eBay for about 40 bucks. You can buy that little resin version of Victory. Not only does Victory not look like Hetty because the face was made more generic eventually, but this looks nothing like Victory. Anyway, it's 40 bucks on eBay, it's about a foot tall. Or you could pay about $19 million as someone did at Sotheby's a few months ago for the 1933 version of the gold coin, the $20 gold coin that depicts Hetty. Um, Artist models, in general, it's still a terrible profession. It still exists a, as a profession. In COVIDian times, it has been an even more terrible profession. Um, this is a recent article in the artist in the art newspaper. Um, but look, it's still making headlines, and it's still fascinating writers, um, including me. So finally. Um, I just want to thank Willow Hagens, who is, I believe, on this Zoom for um, a year-long research journey. That's Willow with um, uh, Carson, also known as the Wild Child. And um, the three best um, images that we have of Hetty Anderson, the family photo, um, the Anders Zorn image of her taking a break while posing, and uh, the bust. And that bust has traveled so many places and seen so much. And uh, still, I can, I can show you its copyright cards from the Library of Congress. And I'm so grateful for your attention. And I only wish that bust could talk. Thank you so much for listening. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you so much, Eve. That was wonderful. And before we get to questions, I know that there was an advocacy subject that you were going to bring up. So I want to remind you about the street to be named after Hetty. Oh, thank you. Oh my gosh, Leslie, you're amazing. Your memory is so much better than mine. So, and you have a tiny kid. Oh my gosh, you're amazing. So um, I am trying to get West 94th between Broadway and Amsterdam Avenue co-named for Hetty Anderson. So evekahn.com, E-V-E-K-A-H-N.com has my email address on it. Email me and I'll send you a link. It's a free, it, there's no cost to sign my petition. I'm trying to get her block west of West 94th Street named for her. I think we can all do that, yeah. Anyone, send me an email, send you the link. Thank you. Again, so for anyone in the audience, if you have a question, just raise your hand and I'll bring the mic to you. Over here. Thank you, Eve. Um, I was wondering if you could give us a sense of what was it about Hetty Anderson physically that made her that heroic type, that made all these great artists look at her and say, wow, she's a goddess. So the most vivid description that we have is Augusta St. Gaudens describing her as goddess-like, handsomest model he'd ever seen of, of either sex. He also describes that she had long legs and um, I'm trying to remember this. I, I have this in my notes. It, it, he literally describes it's rare for you know someone with that great a figure to also have long legs. I think that suited the togas, right? Because you, you know, she was often posed in in mid stride, right? And I think that helped the toga flare. It's a good question. Yes. So she got sick by the late nine, so she gets the job in the late 1910s, she keeps it for a few years. By 1920, 1921, she's not working anymore. So she was, let's see, 27, she was uh, in, in her late 40s by then. And, you know, and, and how debilitated she was, I'm not sure, because she was, you know, she maintained her financial comfort for 18 more years. By the 1930 census, she's listed as having, you know, so at age 57, she has no profession on the 1930 census. You actually answered most of my questions as you went along, seriously. Excuse me. She didn't have any interest in passing for white. Did I understand you to say, even though her brother, last name Dickerson, I don't remember his first name. Yeah. I uh, did. Um, but she could have, mm -hmm. but wasn't interested at all in doing that, even though her life probably would have been a lot easier 
I mean, even though she probably could, you know, still do it without trying to do it, they people probably saw her as, mm -hmm. you know, because of the way she looked. And did I understand you said the father was Caucasian and the mother was African American? So uh, her father and and the father of her brother Charles are listed in various documents. He's listed always as Benjamin Dickerson. I don't know if he ever married her mother. I don't know what race he was. Um, I do know that her brother um, definitely passed and there was a lot of trauma oh, yeah. and secrets in that family. It does a lot of damage. I mean, I'm literally quoting the granddaughter saying that his passing caused, you know, they can see in retrospect how much emotional pain the family was. The, and he, he served in a white regiment in the Spanish American war oh, wow. and he denied his heritage. Um, I know that Hetty stayed in touch with family members, but I also know that um, some of her activist relatives gave big parties and the black press literally listed every person who attended and she's not on those lists. So I'm not sure she was estranged from certain relatives. I also know that St. Gaudens mentioned when he first met her that she would be um, irritated or annoyed. I can't remember the word he used. If, if you said, that she had Negro blood in her veins. And that's in black and white in one of St. Gaudens' letters. And people have asked me about that and said, well, doesn't that imply that she was passing? And when I see that, I think, first of all, I have no idea how St. Gaudens reached that conclusion about how she felt. And um, it's possible that she simply told him, please don't tell people, just simply, can we keep it between us? It's just easier that way for my life. Or, you know, I'm not really sure, but I do know that she stayed in touch with family members who yeah. were activists in the black world. Did you, did you know if she ever spent any time in Newport? Not as far as I can tell. I think she was quite the homebody as far as I can tell. I'm, I'm, I think that Caroline may have gone back to South Carolina. Re relatives remember visiting, were stories of people visiting Caroline back and forth to South Carolina. But um, I, I think she stayed close to home. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Never Thank heard you. of her. <laughs> Unfortunately. But that's, yes. It's not uncommon, it's not uncommon for any artist's model for, for no. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. No, there's, and, and yes, right. So it, she had every imaginable factor going against her for getting her story told, which was one, she didn't want her story told, really. There were journalists who would have dived on that story, right? She avoided the press, right? And she was a woman, she was black, she was not from New York. She didn't have a college education. She had a million strikes against her. And, but she also seems to have craved her privacy, as far as I can tell. And what's funny is that one of her Met colleagues visited her after she left and the colleague said, you know, she seemed okay. You know, she, you know, there were, you know, we gave her a card or something. And um, she was asking about the paintings. You know, she was asking how the museum was doing something like that. And I read that and I thought, damn, she doesn't mention seeing her own image on view. Ah, uh, right. You know, the things you want to read in the archive sometimes just aren't there. Thank you. Is there any record of her going up to Cornish? to Cornish. No, I think specifically they haven't found that she went to Cornish. And Henry Duffy, I hope, is on this call because then maybe he'll, maybe he'll text me and tell me I'm wrong. I believe she never went to Cornish. She posted her St. Gaudens in New York. But I know she was at Chesterwood, and I know that she went to visit Evelyn Beatrice Longman's studios out of town. I know that the artists um, paid her well, and they um, were careful to make sure that they weren't conflicting with each other. Literally, their letter survived saying, you know, if, uh, you know, only if Miss Anderson is willing, could you ask her, you know, and I don't want to disturb your happiness, but, you know, can Miss Anderson come next week, this kind of thing. What year did uh, St. Gaudens die? St. Gaudens dies in 1907. Uh, and then French, was he much, did he, when did he die? French lived into, oh, shoot, I don't have this, somebody Google this really quickly, so I look smart. Yeah, no, I don't. But did French, he French Did lived into the 1930s-ish, okay. yeah. It reminds me a little bit of another successful um, black woman, but who, po who, who, who posed as um, Portuguese, and that was uh, J.P. Morgan's librarian. Mm -hmm. And this brings to mind her um, and how she, she passed for white, stayed with her mother, mm -hmm. you know, traveled the world, blah, blah, yeah. blah. And um, well... 
Thank you. Oh, I was so excited. Oh, I look smart. Um, yes. Um, Belle de Custer Green, flukishly, her father was named Richard Greener. Um, Richard Greener was, so there's a gorgeous novel called The Personal Librarian that's based on Belle de Custer Green's life and it's haunting and powerful and it goes into uh, a lot of detail about her affair with Bernard Berenson, her years long affair with Bernard Berenson, because she asked him to destroy her correspondence and he didn't. So her love letters to him survived, which she did not want them to survive. You see, we all lose control of, our, of how our story gets told. Bell's father, Richard Greener, would have been in Columbia, South Carolina, working at the briefly desegregated University of South Carolina, when Hetty was a kid. So it's possible that Hetty and Richard Greener crossed paths. It's also possible that, because Hetty lived right near Belle de Custer Green in New York, it's possible that they walked past each other on the street and gave each other the nod, meaning, you know, I know where you're from and you know where I'm from, and let's just, <laughs> let's Bella just. Famously yes. wearing her furs. Yes, you know, right, Catholic yeah. Forced to England. Um, did, 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 um, did Hetty, did she dress, is there any record of whether she dressed sort of so upper, that, upper oh, class oh, or whether? All we have is that one photo in which yes. she's very elegant, but yeah. I, that's not my sense yeah. from her family members that she was terribly extravagant about that. There is the story of a couple of diamond rings that she owned and that she was considered glamorous by her nieces and nephews, you know, coming up from Southern New Jersey, but, um, yeah, I'm not, I don't, I'm not sure she tried to draw attention to herself. Any other questions? Well, Eve, that was amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you to all of you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much. That was amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming. We hope to see you again uh, in two weeks on October 21st. Again, evecon.com, sign the petition and buy her book. Thank you all. We'll see you soon.